Welcome to Rock Center Shorts. Our guest today is my colleague, Professor Nate Persley from Stanford Law School. Nate is an expert on voting rights, election law, free speech, and free press. He is also the co-director of the Stanford Program on Democracy and the Internet, the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, and the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project. Thanks, Nate, for being here. Thanks for having me. So there's been a lot of focus on internet platforms and liability issues, free speech, political speech, and elections in the wake of last year's presidential campaign and Facebook and Twitter's ban of President Trump. Both parties have been vocal about Section 230 and liability protections. And so given this context in the national debate, where do you think this issue of platform liability goes from here? Well, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, let me say that this issue of platform liability uh, should be looked at in the context of tech regulation generally, um, because when people talk about Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, they mean a lot of different things. Uh, and so CDA 230 has become more of a metaphor than it has been a particular uh, uh, type of regulation. And so we may see regulation in the tech space on issues of privacy, of course, antitrust, cybersecurity, maybe transparency uh, across various uh, aspects of the industry. Uh, but then most people focus on these questions of uh, intermediary liability and content moderation, uh, which is where the Section 230 label uh, sort of is applied. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that when people talk about getting rid of Section 230 or reforming Section 230, it's often to deal with some problem that has nothing to do with Section 230. Uh, and so just to be clear, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act basically allows uh, internet platforms to um, uh, not be liable for the user speech on their platform and also not be liable for Good Samaritan acts that they take to take down uh, otherwise objectionable speech. And so um, one of the interesting things in the war over 230 is that everybody seems to hate it, but they hate it for different reasons. <laughs> and so Democrats and Republicans have different gripes with the platforms. Uh, Democrats are more likely to say that the problem with 230 is that um, the platforms are not taking down enough speech. They're not taking down enough disinformation, hate speech and other objectionable uh, speech. Uh, and for Republicans, uh, they're concerned that the uh, liberal platforms in Silicon Valley are politically biased in the way that they are taking down uh, or leaving up speech. Now, the truth is none of those objections is actually a Section 230 problem. Um, because if you were to take away Section 230, there would be nothing um, with respect to disinformation or hate speech that uh, would be that would change on the platforms because it, it would have to be the kind of speech for which they would be liable, which would usually be um, some libelous, right, defamation uh, kind of speech or speech that would lead to real world harm. Um, same is true with with bias in the way that they might uh, be implementing their content moderation uh, policies. Um, if you take away Section 230, there's nothing that stops uh, you know Facebook, Google, whoever else from um, taking down all Republican speech and the like. So, um, the, the, so when we talk about uh, changes to 230, we should sort of broaden the lens beyond what might be the original scope of, of 230, which was really just on this question of whether the platforms would be high, um, held liable uh, for the speech on the platform, user speech on the platform. Now, as well, the, the different parties might have different gripes uh, with 230 or with uh, the platforms, it's not clear what the regulatory solution is. There are plenty of different policies that are out there to um, change 230. Some of them are sort of pinprick kinds of policies where you would just modify, you know, increase liability in a particular area. This is what happened with respect to sex trafficking speech and the like uh, with Sasta and Festa. Um, and so there's, there are examples of those kinds of um, alterations. For example, you could hold um, platforms liable to, to be more strict when it comes to bots, like automated speech or the like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and you could, as uh, President Trump tried to do in his executive order following um, some of the Twitter actions against him, uh, try to uh, make them respond, make them sort of uh, be honest in their policies and hold them liable for the promises that they 
make, right? And so that the he had a kind of clever executive order where the um, idea was that the platforms uh, must be true to their policies. And if one of their policies is that they're gonna be politically neutral in content moderation, well then uh, the argument was that the FTC could kind of hold them, it would be a kind of fraud if they were to um, go beyond that. But if you were to have some kind of federal legislation that would lead the platforms to take down hate speech and disinformation, that would likely be unconstitutional under the First Amendment because um, the Supreme Court has upheld all kinds of hate speech as being uh, constitutionally protected. Um, and the same is true for most kinds of lying. There are gonna be some kinds of lying that would be fraudulent or defamatory or the like, but most of the kinds of uh, speech that people find objectionable are actually constitutionally protected. Um, one of the interesting things about the community standards of Facebook, Google, and Twitter is that if we legislated them as policy in the United States, they would all be unconstitutional under the First Amendment. That's true whether you're talking about incitement, whether you're talking about nudity or an obscenity, um, whether you're talking about uh, hate speech, uh, bullying, and the like. All of those community standards uh, would be unconstitutional if you put them into legislation. Now, People are grasping about for models of regulation uh, in this space. And in some ways, uh, the United States might be the follower here, not the leader, uh, because what we're seeing is different models from around the world. Now, the, the Chinese model is, of course, you know, the, the most uh, government dominant, you know, authoritarian model. Uh, but even in less authoritarian regimes like um, uh, India and Turkey, uh, and uh, Singapore, uh, we are seeing these kind of um, middle models where the government is taking a very aggressive uh, uh, move toward these platforms, asking them to take down certain speech that it finds objectionable, uh, forcing them to run labels next to disinformation and the like. Um, and so while those would be, I think, you know, uh, kind of foreign for the United States uh, to emulate, uh, Europe is probably going to be leading the way here. And I think the debate currently uh, underway over the new Digital Services Act is going to um, set the stage for all kinds of regulation of the platforms. Uh, and as was true with privacy uh, legislation, where Europe led the way on GDPR, so too, that might be true in the content uh, regulation space. Uh, now, there are no good answers here, right? Um, it's, it, there's uh, always going to be trade-offs, um, and you know that no one has uh, a, a great sort of speech code that they think the platforms uh, should be following. But uh, particularly with the takedown of President Trump. Um, most recently, there is even even uh, leaders like Angela Merkel were uh, lamenting the power that these platforms have uh, and how it could be exercised, um, you know, to affect elections, to affect um, uh, the speech of world leaders. Uh, and so the Trump takedown is now become the sort of um, I don't know outlier example that is going to uh, set the stage for what kinds of exercises of power by the platforms are proper. I'll say that in the last year, I think that we've seen the, the platforms get much more aggressive in the regulation of speech. I, th there are lots of reasons for that. I think early on, it was because um, COVID disinformation led the, not just COVID disinformation, but COVID itself led the platforms to experiment with and adopt all kinds of new policies to deal with uh, speech that might lead to offline harm. Mm -hmm. And from their perspective, um, COVID provided a wonderful example where they could sort of do the right thing. It was sort of scientific evidence. It wasn't as charged. I mean, it certainly got charged over time, but it wasn't as big an issue as it would be, say, core political speech in an election. But what they did over the summer of 2020 um, with new policies dealing with COVID disinformation and de demoting different types of content, even banning uh, certain accounts, then set the stage for what they could do outside of the COVID context. And so the cries came out, if you can do this for COVID disinformation, why can't you do this for this other realm of speech? And so both that and the kind of unique personality and campaign of Donald Trump and his supporters, 
uh, led the platforms to take unprecedented action uh, in the run up to the 2020 election. Of course, they were, they were keyed in to do this already because of the uh, scandal in 2016 with Russian intervention. Um, but this time, you know, the foreign actors were just a small part of the story in the US. Uh, and instead, the platform started uh, experimenting with all kinds of disclosures and labeling and demotion, and then ultimately takedowns uh, of the president of the United States. And so what's happened in the, in the absence of government regulation, um, we, it's led to the platforms taking it on themselves. Uh, so Twitter and Facebook uh, banned the, the Trump account. YouTube sort of has a rolling ban on the, the Trump account. Um, uh, this has led to sort of ingenious or maybe not, I should say original ways of uh, modes of self-regulation, most notably the Facebook Oversight Board, which is now just sort of got up and running after the election. Mm -hmm. And so most recently the Facebook Oversight Board overturned uh, takedowns of certain types of content that Facebook had um, taken down in, in, in 2020. There was some COVID sort of borderline disinformation that they took down that the Oversight Board reinstated some um, uh, sort of hate speech deal in Myanmar that uh, dealing with anti-Muslim sort of hate speech that they reinstated. Um, there was a nudity issue with, which sort of had relationship to breast cancer advocacy uh, that Facebook took down and reinstated. And then the board said, yes, you, you should reinstate it. And then there was another uh, element of hate speech, anti-Armenian hate speech in Azerbaijan that they um, decided to keep, they affirmed the takedown. Now the actual, the, what they did in these particular cases is not as significant as the experiment of this uh, in self-regulation that they've undertaken. So the, um, and most notably um, this outside board, I mean, we can question and part of the criticism is how outside is it since Facebook had a role in choosing these folks, uh, but these law professors and activists and, and uh, internet experts and the like um, came together in those uh, decisions um, and issued opinions that were heavily grounded in international human rights law. Uh, they also made, gave advice to Facebook on how they should uh, implement the, sort of change their policies to deal with this. Um, I happen to disagree with several of these opinions, but that's, you know, that's true with any, any court. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize the fact that they, they believe, they sort of think of themselves almost like a court and there are certain implications to that. And so as we, as they consider the takedown, the permanent banning really of Donald Trump um, on Facebook, uh, it's hard to see how under the precedent that they've now created for themselves as to what is sort of imminent uh, threats, what is uh, protected speech, how you could justify uh, taking down um, uh, a president of the United States for life. Uh, because if these, the platform is now gonna move in this direction where it, you know, the, this oversight board views itself as a court and thinks about Facebook as like the new public square, the same reason that a government might not be able to uh, ban an individual for life from speaking in the public square, so too, um, the, if, if the oversight board views its role as implementing a kind of human rights standard or free speech standard here, it's hard to see how they could come uh, to a different conclusion. Uh, but this experimentation that we're seeing with the oversight board is really uh, one of the sort of new initiatives, the first silo out uh, in industry self-regulation, I think the hope of people like myself is that it really is the first experiment, but that in the coming years that we'll see a lot more experimentation uh, throughout the industry uh, with different platforms uh, to try to get a lot of these problems under control. Nate, hey, thanks so much for sharing that perspective. That's tremendously valuable uh, and appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks to all of you for joining us.